this week on the Deep Leadership Podcast. And we've over-indexed on quantitative stuff, all the stuff we can measure over the stuff we can't. And all the stuff we can't measure is all that human stuff. And so it's made work pretty toxic. And it's caused businesses to do things in their own interests more than the interests of the people that they serve. Hi, John. It's so good to be back. I love, yeah, I love your podcast. And I love all the things you're doing. And it's, it's a privilege to be invited to be here. Absolutely. I love what you're doing. I mean, I think that uh, I've been following your, all your blog posts. Your, both your books have been amazing. So, uh, and I'm just proud that we're able to work together on this book. At least I got a chance to put some words in this new book and in, in the forward. But what a fantastic book. And the other thing is you're getting me to swear. I normally don't swear on this podcast, but we are going there because this book is called Giving a Shit. And I think we have to talk about it. So, <laughs> so you got me there. Well, yeah, there, and there's a story behind that, but I'm sure we'll get to that. <laughs> we will get to that. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so first of all, I want to start off like you're my go-to guy uh, when it comes to service. You're an expert in, in the area of service. Uh, and the first sentence on your website says something that I really, really love, and I want to get your take on it. it. says, service can change the world. In fact, it already has. Now, explain what that means and why you wrote that. Um, let me start with a definition. Okay. Uh, years ago, I was asked by a CEO of a company to come speak with his executive team. And he wanted me to talk about service because he was... He, he wanted to get the company more focused on service, and he thought he, he should start with the executive team. So at the beginning of my presentation, I asked the whole room, what is service? And the answers I got back were things like going above and beyond for the customer, exceeding customer expectations, making customers happy by solving their problems, stuff like that. It was like somebody ate a marketing book and threw it up. And I said, stop. I ask, what is service? I need some, what fundamentally is service? And I got more of the same. So I had to stop them again. I said, no, you don't get this. Service is more than customer service. And it's not complicated. It's really simple. It's just helping people. It's people helping people to accomplish things and achieve things. And service is something we all do and we all do it all day. I mean, if you help your kids get ready for school, that's service. You take them to the bus stop, it's service. If you help somebody at work, it's service. If you pick up milk on the way home, it's service. Help with dinner, put away dishes, it's service. We do it constantly. It's it's absolutely fundamental to being human. It's how we survived as a species. It's how we've built cities and conquered disease and created bridges and buildings and all these things and gone to the moon and come back. And it's all because we've helped each other. In fact, there are some sociologists who believe it's our superpower. Mm. They, we're one of the only species and may be the only species that will help others at a cost to ourselves. Mm. In fact, we're one of the only species that will help other species. And so I believe it's super powerful for us and I think if we want to cure the ills of the world and make our world a better place, that's the place to start with just helping each other. I absolutely love that. And, and, you know, I wrote in the, in the forward to the book, the fact that I, you know, I, I had to speak at a veterans day event and the, and the, my speech was on service because I think you hear veterans, you see them and you hear this, well, thank you for your service. Well, what does that really mean? And, and so that I walk them through that, uh, uh, the, you know, the gathered VIPs and the students, what is service? And, uh, and, and that's, and, and I said that just because I, I, I'm a veteran and I served my country, it doesn't mean, and I explained to the students how they can serve their school. How can they serve their family? How can they serve their community? Gave examples of it. So again, it's about people helping other people and often sometimes sacrificially as well. Yeah. And I think that's, 
that's an important part of service. It's not about just customer service. And I love the fact that you point that out. And you talk about that all the time. Last time you were on the show, I kept saying customer service and you kept kicking me. <laughs> but you're right. It's about serving others and about, uh, and again, sometimes sacrificially as well. So uh, yeah, so I absolutely love the fact that you stick to this and it's a big part of what you write about, which I absolutely love. Um, let, let's talk about this new book. Uh, it's called Giving a Shit. And by the way, shit is not spelled shit in the book, but it's it's your typical, uh, it's a dollar. So there's, a, there's the book right there. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, you can see it as it's bright or it's a great cover. Um, explain why you chose to call it that. Um, well, there's there's a story. There's always a story. <laughs> um, years ago, I, and I think it was 2017 because I wrote a blog post about it. So I think it was 2017. And I was playing golf with some guys on a Saturday morning. And, you know, you, you talk about family and you talk about your kids and you talk about all these things. And inev inevitably, you talk about work. And one of the guys owns his own business. And he said, you know, I know you talk about leadership and you teach customer service and I need your help. What's something I can tell my team members so they'll deliver great service? Of course, my head starts spinning. I'm thinking of everything under the sun. You know, I want to think of something profound. And um, I don't know, something just bubbled up in me and it just came out. And I said, you got to give a shit. Yeah. And the guy turned to me and he kind of chuckled. And he said, is that it? And I said, well, sort of. Because it's not just about your customer-facing team members. You have to your administrative team has to, your executive team has to, your managers have to, and your customer-facing people have to as well. They all have to care for and serve each other if you want your entire organization to serve the customer. Because it's not just people serving the customer, it's your entire organization serving the customer. And so that's the only way it'll work. And so that phrase stuck in my head and it didn't come out until I started writing the book. The real thing that got the ball rolling for the book was something my wife said. Back in 2019, we had planned on taking a trip in 2020 to Spain. We were going to go to Madrid and Malaga and Barcelona and we had it all planned. Flights, the whole deal. Well, the pandemic killed all that. And my wife, God, God bless her. She's more organized than I am and more patient than I am. So she usually handles all the arrangements. And of course, that meant she handled all of the cancellation and all that stuff. So one day I'm doing something and I walk, walk upstairs and I hear her talking on the phone and then she hangs up the phone and she yells out, you know, nothing is ever easy. And the first thought in my mind was, please, God, don't let that be about me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so I peeked my head in the door and I said, is everything okay? And she says, you know, I don't understand. She had just gotten off the phone with the airline. She said, why do companies make everything so hard? And why does it seem they just don't care about their customers? Well, we carried on and we talked all that through. And, but I started to think about it and I started to think, well, why is that true? It seems like that's true. There's so many companies that make it so hard. And it just seems like they don't care. Mm -hmm. And that really, all, all those questions swirling around, that's really what led to the book. And calling it giving a shit came later. But so that's, all of that together is kind of what brought the book on. Yeah, it, it makes so much sense. And it's funny because we actually had an expression when I was in the military that said my gas gauge was low. We, so we would say, oh, my gas gauge is low. And then, man, my give a shit gauge was low. Like, I don't give a shit. So we we would actually acknowledge when we didn't care. <laughs> and yeah. so after a while, you, know, you, you get worn down and your your gas gauge is very low. And that's that that gauge is, is very low. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I love it. Yeah. Well, there was an interesting thing. The thing I found out was that giving a shit actually means something more than just care and more yeah. than concern. And I don't want to get in that now because that's in the book, but right, right. I found out something about it that was that was important. Yeah. And so anyway. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get into that. But 
So just give give our listeners a flavor of what's the big idea behind the book. Obviously, you told about some of the origin story, but what's the big idea in the book? The big idea is uh, really, it's pretty simple. It, first of all, it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be hard and, and, and they can care about their customers. So we can do better, essentially. Mm. So we can do better than that. And so I wrote the book in two parts. The first part looks at why we're here and why it doesn't have to be this way. The other part of the book is kind of a, a how-to guide on how we can do better. And it's not just better as an organization, it's better individually, how, how in my own individual performance, I can do better, but also how can an organization do? So I kind of talk about both. Mm -hmm. So that essentially is the big idea. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And that's why I love this book so much. It's such an important topic that uh, needs to that we need to be talking more about. Um, in in the book, explain the, the difference or, or the idea of competitive self interest versus cooperative helpfulness. What are, what are the differences? What are these terms, and wh why are they important? Well, I was looking for you know what what is behind the whole issue of companies make it difficult. And the, kind of the first thing I thought was, well, it's because they're just human and humans are, we're selfish. We are, you know, that's what we are. But the more I, I and I, so I started doing a lot of research into that. Is that really true? Or is that what we are? And what I found was that we have kind of two opposing viewpoints. One is based on a popular narrative and the other is based on science. So buckle your seatbelt. I'm going to take you on a ride. <laughs> the popular narrative which comes to us mostly through writing and art and music and drama and religion. Religion played a big part in this. Um, is that humans basically are selfish and competitive at our core. The strongest are the ones that survive and you have to look after yourself, right? You gotta take care of yourself and beat the other guys. That's kind of what we've grown up to know. And you know, business feeds off of that, just like all, a lot of other institutions. And I started to look at, well, why is that? Why is that so? Is that really true? And I'll talk about the science in a minute. But what I found was that for centuries, we have been kind of fed a line and we've been fed that line. I mean, if you think about it, go back to the Bible. If you go back to the Bible in the book of Genesis, there's about two pages where everything's great. Humans are great. You know, it's rainbows and unicorns and all things are good. And then we bite into an apple and it's all downhill from there. You know, the rest, the other 400 pages are a battle between good and evil. And, and, and that line gets picked up throughout history. And, and for example, in philosophy, Thomas Hobbes in the 17th century, he describes it as the state of man or the state of humankind is a war of all against all. You know, we are rotten at the core. And then we get a huge, huge message in the 19th century from a guy named Herbert Spencer. And Herbert Spencer was a contemporary of Darwin. And he kind of takes Darwin's ideas and twists them into his own kind of formation. He actually coins the term survival of the fittest. Darwin did not say that. Hmm. Spencer said survival of the fittest. Darwin actually said something more along the lines of survival of the compassion. Because Darwin, in the book Descent of Man, he talks about the fact that the people who will survive are the ones who cooperate the most mm. because those are the groups that are going to survive, not the ones that fight each other. But Spencer picks up this line. He says, no, it's about survival of the fittest. And he uses that to justify his belief that some races and social classes are better than other people. And that's why they're superior. And that's, that turns into a whole lot of bad stuff. I mean, apartheid came from that. Nazism came out of that. Uh, you know, white supremacy came out of that. And um, so a lot of bad came from that. Um, and then you can add even more to that in the 20th century. We've got people like Ayn Rand, who basically says, you know, you don't need to worry about anybody else. You worry about yourself. Just look after yourself. Your duty is to your own happiness. She actually opposed altruism. Mm -hmm. She opposed looking out for others. She thought that you should only look after yourself. She even wrote a book called The Virtue of Selfishness. Um, and so a lot of that has, in, you know, you get hit with that enough. And we begin to believe it. We begin to believe that that's who we are. And so I read all this stuff and it was kind of a downer. Honestly. You know, I was doing the research and I was kind of like, this is kind of, ugh. 
we are bad people. But a couple things bothered. One was, if that's true, why do we have people that literally sign up to run into a fire to save strangers? And I, it would be one thing if they were running to a fire to save family members, but they run into a fire to save people they don't even know. And why is it when we have a tragedy, why is it that people will come out in droves to help each other? And then one of the things I found in the research was, and I didn't really know this, but the young infants, as young as 18 months, begin showing helpful behavior. They start to do things, and it's without prompting or being told. They just start to do things to help other people. They'll, if an adult drops something, they'll reach out to try to help them pick it up. Um, at two years old, uh, they've got some um, studies that they've done where children will go and try to open a door for an adult that has, has their arms full of things. And they do it innately. And so that really troubled me because I was thinking, well, if we're selfish and competitive, where's that come from? So I went looking at the science and I found a couple of big things. There's more, but I found these couple of big things. One was that we didn't start out this way. We've been on the planet for about 300,000 years. And for about 290,000 of those, we were cooperative and helpful. All the talk that primitive humans were savages is just not true because all the evidence points to them being helpful to each other. And it makes sense, right? Because they had to go out and kill a saber-toothed tiger and you didn't do that by yourself, right? Um, and modern study of primitive groups, they found that, that it confirms that, that uh, there are some, a few modern hunter-gatherer groups that are very primitive, mostly on Pacific islands and things. Um, and they are cooperative and help. In fact, they punish people who are competitive and selfish. And so it wasn't until we started settling down in farming that we started to shift to being more possessive because, okay, now I'm growing, a, I'm growing this stuff for me and my family. And so I've got to defend it. And so the, the mindset set started shifting about 10,000 years ago. Um, but prior to that, we were largely helpful to each other. Now, the other part of the science has to do with biology. I found this really interesting. There are two kind of hormones. There's a lot of chemical stuff going on. Inside of this, but there, there are two uh, particularly influential hormones that come. One is cortisol, and the other one's oxytocin. Cortisol is known as the stress hormone. When we're afraid or we're threatened, it comes into play. Um, and what happens when it comes into play is it increases our our blood pressure and our heart rate. It, suppress, it uh, slows down our metabolism. It slows down non-essential things like reasoning. It's why when you get into a fight, you, you, you're not thinking straight, right? And it's good. We need that. Humans, we have to have it. You know, if we didn't, you know, we'd all be dead. However, long-term exposure to cortisol causes anxiety and depression. It can cause heart disease, it can cause high blood pressure, it can cause digestive issues, it can cause weight gain. A lot of those things come from long-term exposure. We're not meant to live in a world of constant cortisol. On the flip side of that, there's oxytocin, and oxytocin is known as the love hormone or the bonding. It's the, the thing that gives us that warm feeling when we're intimate. It's what uh, causes babies and a mother to bond. And it also is that good feeling you get when you help somebody, when you do something good for somebody, you get that good feeling, right? And the cool thing about oxytocin is that it's not just the giver who gets it, the receiver gets it too. And it grows. The people who see it happen get a hit. So it's like a whole community can feel good because people are helping each other. And on top of that, oxytocin suppresses cortisol. Hey. And because of that, we get health benefits. We get lower blood pressure. We get less heart disease. We heal faster. We get lower rates of depression and longer life. A lot of people that, that are helpful to other people live a longer life. So I guess what I got out of that was that Mother Nature is pretty clear. We didn't start out self-interested and competitive. The preferred option is that we help each other. And it, it makes sense. Yeah, if, if we were helping each other, we're probably going to live longer than if we fight each other. And 
I think this we've let this popular narrative of survival of the fittest, it's kind of won the day. And it's what we hear all the time. And the fallout's been pretty damaging. If you look at business, for example, and I'm sure you see it just as much as I do in the business world, we've put profit over people. You know, mm-hmm. Making money is more important than people. Um, and, and in the leadership world, we've made management more important than leadership because, you know, controlling people is the only way to get the most out of them. And we've over-indexed on quantitative stuff, all the stuff we can measure over the stuff we can't. And all the stuff we can't measure is all that human stuff. And so it's made work pretty toxic. And it's caused businesses to do things in their own interests more than the interests of the people that they serve. And that's one of the biggest, that's a lot, of, that's damaging. And so it, none of it was meant to be that. I don't think. I think we were meant to do something different. And I think it was meant to be better. That's really what I got out of studying all that stuff. And by the way, that, that doesn't take up like the whole book. That's just a little <laughs> portion of it. Well, one of the things that, you know, you talk about, it just makes so much sense. I mean, we are social creatures, right? Look at the the anxiety and depression that came out of the pandemic when people were isolated. They couldn't be around others, right? So we so we we don't like being isolated, right? But yet, you know, as you said, the narrative has been be competitive, take care of yourself, uh, survival of the fittest, you know, no, take care of number one, right? But where we've, where life gets really good and where we really get a lot of joy out of it is through community, it's family, it's, it's, it's having a tribe. I mean, um, you know, I would say, you know, what we did in the military was difficult, right? But we had a crew, we had people that had our backs, we loved each other. I mean, that sounds weird, but we absolutely loved each other. And we wanted to make sure that we got each other home safely. And so that camaraderie that you have between military troops is a deep and and we veterans, we leave the military, we lose that that bond that we have. And that's what you're talking about. That cooperative, that helpful, that working together towards a common goal, we lose that and we miss that. It took me seven years to figure out my true north after I left the military because I I lost all of that connection. And so what you're talking about makes so much sense and it makes sense into what we see in data today. What's the problem what we're seeing with young people today? Anxiety and depression. How can that be? They have everything at their fingertips. I mean, social media should be like connecting people and you're, you're and, and what's happening is no, it's the competitive drive to get likes and shares and and grow your accounts. That, oh, this person has more than me. I've got to work harder. And uh, and instead of getting that community bond, we're getting that, you know, that uh the feeling of you know, I've got to do better and and I've got to, you know, keep keep up with the Joneses. And it's that competitive spirit. And it's only leading to more anxiety and depression. So what you talk about in the book makes so much sense with everything else we're seeing as well. So we are meant, as you say, to be competitive, to be cooperative, and to work together towards common goals. Right. Yeah. And and, and so I think that's where we need to go with the organization. We need, yeah. we need to work in that direction with our organization. So how do we begin that process? How do we make our organizations more cooperative and helpful? I know as a small business, it's easy for me because I'm, I, you know, I mean, we do feel more like a family and I know that sounds, some people might laugh when they hear that, but I, these are like the the people I'm close to every day. And we are more like a family than we are uh, a company. We are looking out for each other's best interests and we are working together towards a common good. But I've also worked 22 years in large companies, and that's really hard to do. So do you have any suggestions on how we become more cooperative and helpful? Yeah. I mean, and there's a whole <laughs> second half of the book is about that. Um, <laughs> I think the easy answer is that we have to get them focused on service. Mm. And the reason I say that is because people often ask me, they'll say, D- does that mean we have to focus on the customer? And I say, no. So then they'll say, well, does that mean we have to focus on the employee? And I'll say, no. They're like, well, what do we focus on? Service. Because if you're focused on caring for people, Mm. you're going to take care of your customers, your employees, your investors, and your suppliers. Because all of those are part of making you successful and you're part of making them successful. I mean, think about it. In those relationships, you're both providing value. 
your customers get products and service from you, you get revenue from them. Your employees, they get paycheck, you get the work done. Your investors get a return, you get capital. Your suppliers get revenue, you get an inventory. And it's all about relationships and it's all about people. So how do we get organizations to focus on service? That's the real big question. And what I did was I looked at a couple of things. I, I had been to a hotel down in South Florida where I saw this in action. I saw this, what I'm going to describe to you in a second, in action. I'll do it quickly. I also saw it in an individual. I talk about a comedian in the book and how he did it. And he actually focuses on service in what he does. Um, but it comes from some of my experience with my parents. When your parents told you um, they wanted to, they wanted to teach you how to say please and thank you at the dinner table. So if they were like my parents, my dad, he said, you know, at some point in my youth, he said, when you ask for something, you say please, and when you get it, you say thank, thank you. So he set the expectation, and then mom and dad had to do. If they weren't doing it, I wasn't. And then of course, when I went to say, hey, can you pass me the salt? My dad would look at me and he'd say, pass the salt what? <laughs> yes, and I would say please. And I'd get it. And he'd continue to look at me and I go, thank you. Yes. And that continued until I became a habit for me. And I think you got to do kind of the same thing for an organization. So my kind of, my model is you have to align the organization to services as a priority. It has to be messaged constantly. It has to be, this is what we do. This is who we are. Your leaders have to lead it by example. They have to demonstrate those behaviors to the people that they lead. And you have to have service every, kind of like I said to my guy on the golf course, everybody in the organization has to help each other. You can't expect just one segment of your organization to be helpful. Everybody has. To. And finally, you have to put care in everything. It's not just about the people. It's about your product. Your product can't just be functional. It needs to be friendly. It needs to be something that your customers can understand and use easily. Your processes they can't just be efficient. They got to be easy because if they're difficult, it's almost like a person being difficult. Mm. So if we circle back to my golf story where I said, you know, everybody has to serve, I would now say everybody and everything has to serve. So you, you've got to put that same care. It, it has to be displayed in everything. But if the organization can start doing all of that, now you're, all the cylinders are moving and you can make it, and you can make it happen. That's how you get the, the, the organization moving in the right direction. You know, when I hear you talk about that and I contrast that with what I typically see in organizational cultures with respect to how they treat people and then customer service organizations uh, and how they treat people, uh, I would say that you have a real competitive advantage is if you can embed service in your organization if you if you care to be helpful to others, right, to the customer who calls, to your colleague who who needs a hand, to your to your boss or or to, to your subordinates, if you are there and you actually care about people and you make that a pri priority as in your organizational culture, you're like head and shoulders above all your competitors. Right. I mean, I, to me, it seems like a major competitive advantage if you have that in your culture. Does that make sense or do you oh, feel the same way? Absolutely. In fact, in the book, I talk about, um, I give a, a good example. I, I could do it really quick. Uh, you, if you, you're making coffee and you go to the, you go to the grocery store and you buy coffee beans, um, you go home and, and it's cheap. It's cheap. You go home and, but you do all the work. You do everything. You got to grind the beans. You got to do everything. You have to do all the work. You can go to a convenience store and they do part of the work. They brew it and do all that, but you have to make it and all that stuff. You have to put in all the stuff to make it the way you want it. Um, and that costs about three times what the coffee that you bought. You bought the coffee, it costs about 30 cents a cup. You buy it, you know, at the convenience store, it's like a dollar fifty, dollar twenty five, whatever. Or you can go to a coffee shop. You can go to a Starbucks or whatever. And they do everything. And they do it all. And you get to go sit in a nice comfy chair. You get to listen to music and use their Wi-Fi. Ooh, it's luxury, right? And you pay $350 for that. So 
The coffee's the same. It's coffee. What's different? The effort and the luxury. That's what's different. It's that service that's changed. And so it's profitable for a business to do it. And yes, it's a definite game changer. I mean, there's a Starbucks is a little light years away from the convenience store. Right, right. Well, I just, you know, I found it in my little business. We, 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 you know, our, our, um, our vision, if you will, or, or admission is to be a different kind of supplier. And so mm-hmm. when the big guys say no, we say yes. When the big guys say uh, that can't be done, we say it can be done. So we just sort of take the opposite approach to big business. And the and, and really what that comes down to is, is a service mindset. Uh, we are going to, we're like, for example, in, in big companies, you have a quality problems. The first thing they, they ask is they try to figure out what you did wrong right? With the product, the industry I'm in. So the, the typical competitors are like, you know, what, what did you do wrong? How did you break it? And, and so we take the opposite approach. We say, when someone calls and says, you know, that this thing's failed, it's like, we'll send it back. We, we've got another one on its way already to replace it. Yeah, love that. And so what, what does that say? Well, oh, so if I, if I take the risk and buy from a small company, you know, John's small company versus buying from the big guy, I could get in, uh, you know, I it, I could be a risk, but it's not a risk because if anything goes wrong, John sends him a replacement part right away and doesn't even ask any questions. And, and you and I think a brand that does that. Yeah, exactly. They only it, have to experience that once and they know this is the way they treat people. I'm sticking with them. That's a hundred percent. And not only that, my industry, in my industry, people talk. And so, you know, because it's a B2B business and so other, uh, other, you know, I, I sell to the utility industry, the electrical utility industry, and they all talk to each other and like, oh, I had a problem with the peak product, but they just sent me a replacement. No questions asked. And yeah. and you're like, tell me, tell me you want to, you want to spend less money on marketing dollars or less, you know, dollars in marketing? Do that a lot. Yes. And the word of mouth is going to get you more orders and you know what to do with. Customers are your best marketing tool. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And again, it's, it's, it's what you go back to is you talk about, it's about caring. It's like, I, yeah. I don't want you to be down. I want you to get back up. I'm going to send you a replacement. We'll figure out what happened later. You know, and that's like, well, I'm going to, I, I take care of you first. And then we, we worry about the details. Yeah. It's not, it's not about winning a game. It's about solving a problem. Yeah. 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 I love that. I love it. So what do you hope to, uh, to happen as a result of this new book? I would really love for just to start the conversation. I want to get people talking. And then for those brave souls that want to make change, that they do, that they go out and, and make some change. They, whether it's in their personal kind of service excellence practice, or if it's for an organization. I mean, if it's somebody like you who runs an organization who says, you know what, I'd like to change my organization. I want to make it better. I want it to, to do this, that maybe they do that. But ultimately, or at least at first, I'd love to just have it the conversation gets started and have it to be something that people are talking about and saying, hmm, we need to make some changes. So that would be the first step. I like it. Just start beginning that conversation. And again, listeners, if you're listening in, you're saying, wow, this makes a lot of sense. Uh, that's why, that's why Neil's on the show. <laughs> and that's why we are getting you to think about these things. And again, we want you to be successful. I want you to be as successful as a leader and I want you to make a difference as a leader. And one way you can make a difference is by caring and 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 caring for others, whether it's your, you know, again, it's your suppliers, it's your customers, it's your coworkers, yeah. it's your boss, it's the people in your community. You do that and you can make a difference. And it can also be a competitive strength for you to be more profitable, more successful, live a, a better life. So again, these are these are timeless principles. As Neil pointed out, it comes from our history. It's how we were we were originally. Uh, designed to to work and operate as humans, and we've got to get back to it. So, uh, Neil, well, if there was one thing you could tell people that would make their life better and make their world a better place, what would it be? Um, one of the bigger messages in the book is the pause. Mm. Take a pause and start to see other people, and to be and just be kind. You know. It doesn't have to be big giant stuff. It doesn't have to be big time consuming stuff. It can be, you know, just give somebody a smile, open a door, share a kind word, let somebody in on the, on the freeway, you know, um, but do it and start doing it every day and take that moment to pause and just see people 
instead of thinking of, I've just got to do my thing. I'm, it's, it's all about me because it's not all about me. Mm. We need more of that. I love it. How many li- listeners, how many times have you heard me say leaders, it's not about you. <laughs> so people, I, it's not about you <laughs> as well. So I, that's a great message. Um, so Neil, what's next for you? Oh, um, well, I mean, I want to continue to do the work that I do. Um, I work a lot with uh, smaller, medium-sized companies to share with them these ideas and to help them um, either grow their leadership or grow their their service practices. Um, but I also have a couple of book ideas, um, and one one's about um, the fact that we all, most of us, do kind of everyday jobs, and what can we do to make those jobs more meaningful and 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 kind of create a noteworthy brand for ourselves. And then the second idea I have is to, I've been teaching about service for years and years and years, and it's to kind of pull all that stuff together and kind of put it in one place into like a, almost like a handbook. Um, Mm. Here's a bunch of things, you know, something you don't let, something you wouldn't read from cover to cover, something more along the lines of, you know, here's, oh, here's something I can do. Oh, yeah. Something kind of like that. I I don't know. Those are just a couple ideas floating around in my head. Well, uh, as you know, you're part of the Deep Leadership family. So when you do get those ideas in paper, we're going to have you back and we're going to talk about them because I do love both those ideas. I mean, um, you know, uh, the idea of worthwhile work is such an important thing. We had uh, Ken Blanchard on the show and we talked about that, the importance of uh, worthwhile work. And it's one of the things that I taught in my first manufacturing plant. You know, we we made people realize uh, what they were doing doing had an impact on the world and being able to connect them to that versus just, you know, machining or plating apart. It's like, no, you're actually making something that keeps the lights on and, you know, and you connect them to something worthwhile. The other thing too is if you think about it, a lot of our identities is associated with what we do and not necessarily who we work for. So we're, we're a great sales manager. I'm a great salesman. I'm a great manufacturing manager. And, you know, and so our identity also also comes from who we what we do, not necessarily who we work for. So I think what you're doing talking about your 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 next book, I love that idea, and there's there's a lot of neat stuff on that as well. So I love that idea. So we'll definitely have you back. I, that's that's certainly one that I I love to talk about. So <laughs> so uh, what final message would you like to leave with our listeners today? I'm going to leave you with the last four words in the book. Go do some good. Mm. Go do some good. Think about what you do and why you do it. I mean, is, is your priority what's best for you or what's be- best for something bigger? Is it, you know, hopefully it's, you, you, it's for something bigger, but I'll go back to take that pause and think about what you can do and go do some good. Absolutely love it. Uh, go do some good. Listeners, uh, you're hearing this. Hopefully it's, hopefully it's firing you up because it's firing me up and I want to do some good in my business and in my community and in the people that surround me. And hopefully you want to do that as well. Uh, Neil, how can our listeners find out more about you and all your books? I will give you all about four or five things real quick. Um, you can go to my website, neilwoodson.net, neilwoodson, all one word, dot net. Uh, my books are both on the website. They both have pages on the website, neilwoodson.net forward slash The Uncomplicated Coach. That's my first book, The Uncomplicated Coach, all one word, or neilwoodson.net forward slash gas or giving a shit. Um, and that's the page for that book. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. Dial me up on LinkedIn. Just dial in Neil Woodson, N-E-A-L is how you spell my name, N-E-A-L Woodson. Um, search for me, please. I, I, I like to connect with people and I post all the time on, um, X or Twitter and Instagram. And my handle there is at Neil Woodson, all one kind of word smashed together. So you can, I'm all over the place. <laughs> Absolutely. And we're going to put links in the show notes for all of Neil's resources. And again, if you follow me on Twitter slash X, uh, you know that I interface with Neil a lot. I, I'm always retweeting, sharing, uh, because he's a man with a lot of wisdom around the subject of service. And again, absolutely, I highly recommend that you pick up this book. It's called Giving a Shit. And the links are in the show notes. All the links are here. And again, uh, get it, go out and get your, yourself a copy. If you're watching it on YouTube, you'll see it's a bright orange cover. 
Uh, and uh, it's absolutely a beautiful book, and it's a well written. And uh, the the forward is phenomenal, by the way. Uh, <laughs> had a great author in the, in the doing the forward. But here's the deal, listeners. Neil and I have a special opportunity right now for all of you to get a free copy of this book called Giving a Shit. So here's the deal. This is what you do. The first 30 people who subscribe and comment on this video that you're watching right now, uh, and you comment below, below me on this video, uh, you will receive a free signed copy of this amazing book. So we have 30 copies that are signed copies, and I will mail it out to you uh, if you like this video and comment on this video and also su subscribe to the channel. So just go to YouTube, search Deep Leadership, and you're going to find all of the videos for this podcast and other videos as well. But you want to look for the one with Neil and I talking about giving a shit and you're going to want to comment on it. And the first 30 people to do, you get a free signed copy of this book. Now, I always say that we give free things out on the show. This is a free thing. And again, it's in celebration of our 300th episode. Neil, I'm so happy you could be my guest on number 300. I love this book. I love what you do and keep doing it. And we'll have you back uh, when the next one is finished as well. Thanks, John. It's been a privilege. Thank you very much. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well.